five, four, three, two, one. Hello, my name is Don Jorgensen. Welcome to our discussion of issues of the day. With me today in the studio is Terry Norelli, a Democrat and member of the New Hampshire House of Representatives since 1930, oh, correction, 1996. <laughs> Please, you're not that old, I realize. She is also the current Democratic leader and was Speaker of the House from 2006 through 2010. It is noteworthy that Terry was the first Democratic Speaker of the New, York, New Hampshire House in 84 years. Additionally joining us today is Cindy Rosenwald, also a Democrat who has been a member of the New, York ha the New Hampshire House since 2004. Well, now on to the issues uh, that we face. Since 2010, we have heard that the primary focus of the current leadership of the House, headed by Speaker O'Brien, was to be jobs, jobs, jobs. How does the track record match the promises? Well, I'd like to do a little bit about their track record and also add a little bit about what the Democrats did because we know that this uh, bad economy actually started do while the Democrats were in the majority in the New Hampshire House. And so we started to do some things to prepare us. For instance, we passed uh, job training legislation where it was a public-private partnership between businesses and state government um, to do some job training and it actually involved our community colleges as well and has been a very, very successful program. Um, we also passed uh, one of Governor Lynch's initiatives, which was New Hampshire Works. Um, that allowed businesses to help retain highly qualified uh, employees when mm -hmm. they might otherwise have had to uh, let them go, helped train new employees and really helped businesses to weather uh, the storm, weather the downturn. And mm -hmm. I think that was, has been very successful as well. When you talk about uh, jobs, um, I think you also talk about being business friendly. Um, how do you help businesses who are the ones where, where the jobs are created? And so a couple, there were a couple of uh, major uh, business community high priority initiatives that had been initiatives and high priorities for a number of years um, that once the Democrats uh, had the majority, we actually worked with the co business community to get them through. One was workforce housing. Uh, because in this state, that's really a problem. Uh, businesses need uh, highly educated and uh, skilled workforce, and housing is expensive here. So we finally got workforce housing legislation passed. Um, also, the business community had been very interested in a research and development tax credit uh, that had been unsuccessful until we took the majority. Um, and so we also passed research and development tax credit, which helps businesses to innovate and therefore to create more jobs. Uh, unfortunately, uh, this year, those, the workforce housing and the research and development tax credits were actually at risk with this Republican uh, majority. The House uh, actually repealed the workforce housing twice. And the Senate fortunately killed it both times. And the research and development tax credit, while Democrats and Republicans, House and Senate, the governor, everybody supposedly agreed with it, the House Republicans put it at risk by attaching a social agenda amendment to it that the Senate didn't want. Interesting. Cindy might also want to talk about some of the budget issues. Right. I, actually, I was thinking um, not only did the Democrats have initiatives that grew the economy and led to more jobs, but the budget passed by the Republican it's in a couple of notable areas actually led to job losses. So for example, the Republican budget led to a tax increase on hospitals of $115 million from one wow. year to the next. These are some of our largest employers across the state, and hospital jobs are very good jobs. Uh, since last July, just a little more than a, a year ago, there have been nearly 2,000 hospital jobs lost across the state. In fact, last week the Speaker of the House tried to claim that 
the Republicans had created 400 additional uh, hospital jobs and in fact a little research by the media determined that hospital jobs have actually been lost. Also uh, the budget cut over 90 million dollars in the state portion of highway funds along with the federal matches to that money we're talking about a total of 350 million dollars of road construction projects that New Hampshire won't have and one has to ask the question out in Londonderry what does this mean to the widening of I-93 we've also lost jobs in private nonprofit uh, organizations that have contracted with the state so really in every sector we've been losing jobs I would add one thing to that as a result of the budget and that's uh, the significant cuts to our university system also led to the loss of significant jobs at the university as well. So you can see that the actions uh, that the Republicans took with regard to the budget um, have certainly cost jobs uh, and the actions that were taken by the Democrats were there to help work with business to help uh, increase jobs. During the um, downturn. Mm -hmm. New Hampshire, under the Democrats, actually had an uh, unemployment rate that was significantly less than the national average. And that. in fact, it went down consistently every single month until the month that the uh, first month of the Repu new Republican budget, uh, when it inched up some. It's coming back down a little bit again now with the revival of the uh, national economy. Um, but I think the record is uh, pretty, the evidence is there that Democrats worked to increase jobs and mm -hmm. uh, Republicans record isn't so great. I'd add one more thing which has gotten maybe not quite as much attention because it's not related to the budget but there was a Republican effort to de-license a number of professions mm -hmm. in New Hampshire. It would have led to uh, de-licensing of 29,000 professionals across the state in all kinds of fields, hairdressers and cosmetologists. Well, there are a lot of public safety issues when you start de-licensing the people who have to make sure that the implements are clean and sterile that there's not fungus growing in the foot baths, for example. Court reporters, if you are involved in a trial and your ability to have a good appeal depends on a good solid record from the first trial, you want to make sure that the person is properly trained and licensed. And in addition, many of these professions are very small micro businesses. Mm -hmm and they were under attack through no fault of their own by the right, rightest of the right wing in the New Hampshire House, and it came very close to passing. That's interesting. So it would have effectively allowed anybody to come in and do something even without any training, without any credentials. Well, that's exactly right. And someone who had lost their professional license in another state, for example, if you had been a licensed massage therapist in Massachusetts and perhaps you crossed a boundary with a patient, you would not need to be licensed in New Hampshire. That's just not safe for and, our residents. And the other thing is, is that the small business professionals opposed it. They mm -hmm. came out literally by the hundreds right. for the hearings on this and yet <clears throat> it still came pretty close to passing. That's amazing. That is just amazing. Well, on to another issue. The Speaking of the current leadership headed by Speaker O'Brien, uh, they seem to have a rather extreme view of our educational sy system, such as eliminating compulsory education, repealing the need for kindergarten, what are your thoughts on this and how will this impact our children? Um, well, again, I'd like to think about what are the uh, differences in the philosophy between the Democrats and uh, the Republicans, partly because I think for the first time in my 16 years, certainly in the legislature, 
there's never been such a stark contrast between the values that drive Democrats and those that drive Republicans. And I think education is one of those areas where that's really crystallized. Um, Democrats believe that every child in our state should have access to a high quality education. It's really important for the individual child, but it's also really important for our state, for our state's economy, for mm -hmm. democratic society, for strong communities. Um, and so that's why Democrats, when we were in the majority, worked really hard on improving the quality of our education in the schools. And you mentioned kindergarten. That was um, actually initially an initiative of Governor Shaheen's when she was the governor, um, and she did it with incentives, and yet here we were many years later still with a number of communities without public kindergarten. Well, the, Dem the Democratic majority finally ensured that every child in the state of New Hampshire now has access to public kindergarten. We also were successful in lowering or in improving the success rate, graduation success rate. And we did that uh, both by lowering the dropout age and by adding programs, alternative programs to help students uh, succeed. Um, so we worked in ways to try to improve the quality of education in our state. In a, for just a moment, you said lower the drop off age, dropout age, you mean increase uh, we, we the dropout age? Increase the dropout age and we lowered, lowered the, the dropout rate. rate. And right. we became, I think, the second lowest dropout rate in the country. Yeah. We Nation. were remarkably successful at getting our students successfully out of, of the secondary mm -hmm. education. But in addition to attacks on the public school system that you've mentioned, such as trying to repeal kindergarten, the um, legislature has also looked at, again, lowering the dropout age, removing the requirement for compulsory education at all, which a majority of Republicans in the House voted for. Actually, the House sent that bill, bill that, to the, the bill to end compulsory education and the bill to lower the dropout age were sent the to House the House actually sent over to the Senate. They've tried to lower the standards, and then that wasn't enough, so they took aim at post-secondary higher education. And last year in the budget, reduced the state funds to the university and um, community college system by nearly 50 percent and as a result college became more expensive and, and a college education at our public colleges was already pretty high in New Hampshire there was really no choice but for the university tuitions to go up at the same time as the speaker was insisting that we cut the tobacco tax he was willing to make a college education more expensive while he thought cigarettes should be cheaper. Less expensive. And less expensive. But I think, you know, the American dream is that every child who wants to go to college has a shot at expanding their horizons and taking advantage of every opportunity. And consistently, they have tried to make it harder for people to get a good public education and, and now they're trying to send taxpayer dollars to religious and private schools and claiming that's not going to be an increased burden on the cities and towns. We don't believe it. Well, uh, well it's, it's the cities and towns still have to pay for the infrastructure of their educational system that's already in place. Right. You know, they, this is a, a voucher bill. They've dressed it up by calling it a scholarship bill. But as Cindy said, it really does divert dollars that would otherwise go to public education to private, religious, and home schools. And when you combine the efforts that they have been pushing to weaken our public schools, mm -hmm. like no kindergarten, lower, uh, lower dropout age, lower standards, those kinds of things. And you combine that with uh, efforts to uh, divert dollars to private schools, you can see why people are saying that this legislature is really interested in trying to privatize education. As I said, I think Democrats are about every child having access to a quality education. I think that's pro-business and pro-jobs, too. Most assuredly. 
Uh, over the past two years, we have heard a great deal about leaving towns and citizens to pay for costs previously, previously covered by the state, commonly called downshifting. I have heard leaders from the House, led by Speaker O'Brien, claim that downshifting did not occur. occur. Was that true or false? Uh, well, downshifting actually did occur, and it occurred in two ways. Um, first, there is direct dollars um, in the budget. The state actually helps local communities with direct aid. Mm -hmm. um, and the budget, this biennium, had $112 million less in direct aid to cities and towns than the last biennial budget had. So there was definitely a downshift in direct aid. In addition to that, um, there's a lot of things that the state pays for that if we don't provide them, local communities are stuck having to provide them or to suffer the consequences of uh, some of those programs. Um, things like um, the Children in Need of Services programs or mental health assistance that have consequences in local communities when uh, the state doesn't pay for that program. And I know in Nashua, Cindy could talk about right. what's happening in Nashua well, right now. Exactly, so it's the Nashua School District had a very successful in-school truancy program that served those children in need of services. Mm -hmm. But it cost about $100,000. And with the end of that program, the school district was not able to maintain it within the schools they had to move it to one of the courthouses and the uptake was much much lower because the students weren't there and it required way too many resources for the city to move the students staff the building and so the success rate dropped by about a third almost overnight because accessibility was diminished substantially mm -hmm. And that had been a very successful and important program mm -hmm. for a city like Nashua. So one of the many things that the lack of $112 million cost the towns and states, towns and state, uh, based on, on a reduction in performance. Well, and, and for example, we cut almost all of our substance abuse treatment and diversion programs for adults and really for adolescents as mm -hmm. well. If you think about the costs, some of them are law enforcement costs. Some of them are less direct, but also very important. Other economic costs, lost productivity, destroyed families, uh, crime, for example. So there, there really is a downshift, and it's both discreet and, and also really obvious. The hundred, uh, just to clarify, the $112 million was direct aid right. that the state actually gives to local communities. Some of the okay. programs that Cindy's talking about is what we call indirect aid or an indirect downshift in the mm -hmm. sense that the programs are run by and paid for by the state prior to this budget. And if they're eliminated, like the CHINS program, the Children mm -hmm. in Need of Services program, or some mental health um, assistance or for instance we cut domestic violence programs right. substantially and when those domestic violence programs are not in place then you have higher costs on your local police mm -hmm. um, on your court systems um, when you for instance for mental health when you don't when you have people who otherwise could be treated are not, they end up in our emergency rooms, they end up in our courtrooms. Um, so the, we end up with problems, increased problems in the educational settings. So these kinds of indirect downshifting, it's hard to put a dollar amount on it, but it's significant and the consequences of it are significant as well. We don't hear about the victims. Right. In and that situation. Right. Not all of the downshifting is onto the property taxes and municipal budgets. So, for example, the $115 million hospital okay. tax increase, that not only resulted in, in job losses of close to 2,000 jobs, but it also led to higher insurance premiums that are paid by businesses and individuals. Sad story. 
now <clears throat> that leads on to the next issue which is the upcoming budget where speaker o'brien indicated he wants to cut another uh 400 million dollars uh where would that come from and what would the implications be to the towns and citizens well, I think that's certainly a legitimate question to which I'd like to know the answer. <laughs> um, I will say that the House, uh, in addition to cutting some revenues in this current budget, for instance, um, Cindy referenced the reduction in the cigarette tax, um, that reduces the revenues that were coming to the state. And instead, as she said, we have you know less help for those with mental health or children in need of services or um, students that are going to, to college. Um, we cut revenues for the highways, which cost us jobs. Um, and in addition to that, the House has already passed a number of bills that will have an, the effect of reducing revenues in the next budget, right. even though they've passed them now and have not identified where the cuts will come in the next budget. And the estimates for what they passed out of the House are anywhere from 150 to $300 million. And now the speaker is saying, well, there's another $400 million that we could cut. If you think about well, let's take two departments, entire departments, the judicial branch and corrections. If we eliminate both of those, it falls short of the $400 million cut that uh, the speaker is calling for. If you take eliminate all of the funding, Cindy talked about how much we cut in higher ed, you right. could eliminate <clears throat> all of the funding to higher ed and we wouldn't get halfway there That's right. to his $400 million. And also many of our programs bring in federal monies to match ours, so actually a $400 million cut is, w is much bigger than that sure. and is probably close to seven or $800 million by the time we lose the federal funds. So basically, rather than pay it forward, we're going to spend it forward. Um, and, you know, we're certainly going to cut it forward. Um, you know, as I said, we're, talk we've all we we're already talking about bills that would reduce revenues in the next budget without identifying how we're going to pay for those cuts and yes. looking at more. Um, certainly, Democrats believe in limited and efficient government. But the truth of the matter is, we do believe that there's a role for okay. government when it comes to the common good and shared responsibilities. And certainly uh, public safety, uh, when it comes to crime, and when it comes to our health, and when it comes to the roadways, uh, are, are things that I think are common good and shared responsibilities. And speaking of shared responsibilities, one of the cuts in the budget was many of the business auditors who work for the state. So the estimates of lost revenues from, from tax cheating is between 45 and $50 million. So while individuals are still expected to pay taxes, we've made it easier for unethical businesses to evade their shared responsibility. And we've actually ended up cutting the potential of legitimate revenues that we should be getting. Interesting. Well, the current uh, leadership headed by Speaker O'Brien claimed that the Democratic budget had too much spending with too many taxes and fee increases, which led to deficits. How does that idea stack up against what you know? Um, I would say that, first of all, that the Democratic record on the budget has certainly been distorted. Mm -hmm. um, and it has been distorted time and time again. Uh, and I would remind everybody, while things are definitely improving now, uh, not long after the Democrats took the majority, uh, we went into the worst recession since the Great Depression. Um, when things are really bad, the need for services actually increases. And so you have a lot more people who are unemployed, who don't have health insurance because they can't afford it, and other problems that need to be addressed. And so two things happen. Um, you have an increased need for services, 
that's the spending side of the ledger, and you actually have a decrease in revenue collections uh, because businesses aren't making as much money or people aren't uh, spending uh, mm -hmm. as uh, buying as many lottery tickets or whatever they're doing that are raising revenue. So revenues go down and the need for services goes up. Um, we actually weathered that storm, managed to keep in place the services that some of our most needy citizens uh, required during that time. And we did it. There was no increase in general business taxes. There was actually, there wasn't any increase in the tax burden. Our, the tax revenues that were collected in the 2010-11 budget were about equal to those that were collected in the 2004-05 budget. Six years later, we were collecting the same amount of money serving a lot more people mm -hmm. and you know so that's how we weathered uh, how we weathered the storm um, one of the other things that really uh, needs to be corrected is that the democratic budget that just ended last june actually had a 17 million dollar surplus I know you've heard the Republicans say again and again that we left some unbelievable deficit, but the truth of the matter is the budget that the Democrats passed and that ended this past June had a $17 million surplus. The budget that the Republicans passed this current year that we are still in, they passed it with a $14 million deficit for this year. And not only did they have a built-in deficit, but we've since stacked up some judgments and fines from the federal government that have taken that potential deficit to more like 30 or $40 million. And that's amazing. And they've cut revenues. Mm -hmm. And they cut revenues, I would add, too, that they cut revenues. Um, and then they said, oh, look how close we came to our uh, revenue projections, the Democrats had higher revenue projections. Well, we had higher revenue projections because we would not have cut the tobacco tax right. and we would not have cut the funding for the uh, r roads and bridges, for instance, or for the business tax auditors. Sure. Well, on to a different issue. I have consistently heard comments about <coughs> the war on women and the war on families. How do you see this? I see it as a really broad scale attack and, and um, I'm all over this one. <laughs> because I think if, if you think about it just briefly, you think this is a war on women's health, but I think it's much broader than that. It is both an economic and a social war. So in addition to trying to repeal a 12 year old bipartisan mandate that contraceptives be covered by private insurers and trying to limit women's reproductive health care access that particularly hurts low-income women. They have, uh, as we've mentioned, attacked the public education system, which women really care about, uh, tried to de-license professions that a lot of young women have worked very hard to get their professional licensing at and developed small businesses that successfully uh, allow them to raise their families. They have um, repealed the minimum wage, which leaves us with no state minimum wage. They have attacked the systems that serve people who are elderly and poor, people who have disabilities, people who are ill. These are all systems where, where women are primarily affected as the decision makers for their families. So I, I think they have just taken direct aim at women and families, um, early childhood education, domestic violence programs. It's as if they want you to be unsafe, uneducated, and sick. And poor. And, and poor. And poor. And poor.
Right. And you know, you talked about the domestic the cuts to domestic violence programs, but they also uh, brought forth a few very dangerous um, bills that would have put the lives of women at risk when it comes to domestic violence. Bills that um, would change some of our domestic violence laws. For instance, um, if a police law enforcement is called to the scene of domestic violence and they see evidence uh, that it has taken place, they can arrest. Um, there was a bill put forth that they, the law enforcement would actually have to witness right. the domestic violence before they could make an arrest. And that would clearly put someone's life at risk, at risk. if police were not able to make an arrest Certainly. and then that you know something even worse happened. There is um, a New Hampshire gun check which when you do a check for restraining orders you check not only the federal registry but the state registry which has mm -hmm. some things that are not included in the federal and they wanted to eliminate the New Hampshire portion of that. So you have things that actually not only cut programs but actually put women's lives at risk. And when you talk about contraception, um, they actually had the nerve to say that we didn't need, insurance didn't need to cover contraception. They could just, women could just go get free condoms at Planned Parenthood. And the thing that was so nervy about that is just the week before they voted to defund Planned Parenthood. So this is absolutely uh, all about you know, making lives of women and their children and families less safe and more difficult. Very disappointing, extremely disappointing. Well, we have come to the end of our time. I have a hundred questions <laughs> I would like to continue to ask, but I think we'll it's time back. to say, Promise? <laughs> Excellent. Uh, I think it's time to say thank both of you for taking the time to join us today. Uh, hopefully, we've clarified a lot of questions that many of voters around our town and towns have. So again, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks thank so much you. for having us. Take care.